before I'm even introduced to Kirk Hammett, he's sitting there noodling on his guitar, and he looks up to me, and he's like, so who are you? What do you do? <laughs> it's really funny. And I said, well, uh, my name's Scott, and allegedly I'm a bass player. <laughs> so there's like, I don't know, like 20 people, engineers, and, all, and then the band, and all of standing in like a semicircle around me. And then Lars is like, all right, man, uh, no pressure, but let's hear it. This episode has been a long time in the making. It is the last live interview I have in the can, and it takes me back to good memories from about a year ago. I'm Jason Heath. This is Controversy Conversations, and we are talking today with San Francisco Symphony principal bassist and San Francisco Conservatory bass faculty member Scott Pingle, who is a wonderful person, and I just admire him so much for everything he's done, really. He's been on the podcast before, and you can check out that previous episode, but what we're talking about today was this unique opportunity presented to Scott to play a Cliff Burton tribute solo with Metallica on stage and Lars Ulrich on drums and the San Francisco Symphony to open the Chase Center here in San Francisco, two sold-out concerts. It's just such a cool story and really heartwarming story and seeing all these people together especially in the middle of this pandemic I, I think there's extra poignancy to this but it was a totally amazing experience for Scott as you'll hear in this interview this was recorded to be transcribed for Base World, which is the journal of the International Society of Basis, and I decided to hold off publishing this until that got published. And we had various issues come and go, and then during the pandemic, and now Scott is the featured story in Base World. So go to isbworldoffice.com, and we are linked up to in the show notes for that. And yeah, it's so much fun to go back in time with Scott and hear about this amazing experience. A quick shout out to our sponsors, Dorico, Ear Trumpet Labs, Practisma, and Modacity. More on them later, but let's dive into this conversation and hear a little bit of that solo with Scott Pingle. with a personal story. So I started playing electric bass yeah. at 14, something like that. Okay. Similar story to you. Yep. Had my Kill 'Em All t-shirt. Awesome. Columbia Record Club t audio cassette of Kill 'Em All. And no I listened kidding. to that thing. And there was this bass solo. Yeah. And I remember trying to figure it out on my electric bass mm -hmm. and just thinking, who is this guy? And learning more about Cliff Burton. Yep. And then fast forward several decades. And several? <laughs> well, a few. <laughs> I've got, I don't have that many gray hairs. I have, well, I have a lot, I guess. Now. Well, so a, a student of mine comes in and he says, I was at the San Francisco Symphony opening concert with the Chase Center yeah. and Scott Pingle had this big bass feature. And I said, really? <laughs> and so then he told me about it. And I started to look in a Rolling Stone magazine. You were up there and it's gotten all these views and it's just totally incredible. And it's a really cool story. So how on earth did you end up playing kind of your version, anesthesia, pulling teeth, and then some up there in front of 18,000 people. Just, I don't even know how to start, but oh, <laughs> tell, okay. tell, tell the story. Like, how did this, how did this uh, opportunity unfold? Well, I guess it would best to just 
to explain how I came in first in contact with Cliff Burton it was similar to you. I started playing electric bass when I was around 15 years old and was not an uh, upright player or anything like that at that point. Um, just only interested in, in the affectionately called the pork chop, you know, the, the electric bass. <laughs> and, and my brother was a huge Metallica fan and I, he's the one that turned me on to it. And I, so I came into Metallica right around the time that Injustice for All came out. And uh, I remember we were listening to it and then my brother said, hey, listen to this album. This is this bass player that was just passed away and this was this his signature solo. And I remember listening to it with my brother and and just really loving it. And around that same time, I was uh, just starting to get exposed to various kinds of music that was really inspiring to me uh, and the instrument of the electric bass. And so I felt motivated to... Um, finally get one and it's so similar to you yeah like I, I some, some of my the first stuff I did was was playing a cover band that played Metallica tunes and Led Zeppelin and various other bands and but we didn't have a singer yep. so we just <laughs> we played them as instrumentals <laughs> which is just hilarious uh, but it was what we could do and uh, or any of us was we were too embarrassed to sing I suppose uh, so then fast forward many many years later and uh, it's kind of a funny story actually when I got the position in the San Francisco Symphony and I was telling that same brother about where I, that I was going to be moving to San Francisco and, and uh, I explained that you know he's like so what is it the San Francisco Symphony or something and I said yeah it's the San Francisco Symphony music director Michael Tilson Thomas and then it just suddenly rang a bell because it, it, because it didn't register before and he says wait a minute is that the orchestra that recorded with Metallica that was <laughs> so the S&M like, right? yeah. what that, you're going to play with them so now suddenly it was cool otherwise it just was totally totally irrelevant and uh, so then it's funny to jump even, you know, now to the present day. And, and um, it was very special because my brother actually flew out here and went to both of the shows. Wow. So that same brother was there uh, and uh, participating in it. It was really special. Uh, but anyway, so how it, this particular thing started is right around the time that they announced that it was um, – happening michael tilson thomas approached me and and uh this is back in march we were out on the road on tour they uh had just announced the concert and the tickets had gone on sale it sold out in seconds and uh then they were talking about adding a second show so there was all this buzz and then michael pulls me aside and says you know we're still in the sort of planning phases for s ways that we can use the orchestra you know in unique ways and make this a little different than the first S&M and we're thinking of you know brainstorming different ideas of how we can maybe feature some people in the orchestra would you have any thoughts on that would you be interested in that and I and I immediately said yes and I said I, th I think I have an idea but just let me sit on it a little bit and see if I can pull it off and I'll get back to you and so as soon as we got back from tour I started uh, listening to different versions of it and I grabbed my upright bass and started toying around on it and I was thinking you know what I think I can pull this off I want to play Anesthesia Cliff Burton's signature solo one of his signature solos but do sort of my own spin on it but I'm going to play it with the bow and I'm going to use an electric upright bass because I knew that the effects that I was going to use probably would cause problems uh, with an acoustic bass so I figured I needed to get my hands on an electric upright and so after I did some lead work and managed to get in contact with this company in Italy called Alter Ego, uh, and they had agreed to make a bass for me for this show, uh, and I started to do research and talking with people about which effects I needed, and I got all those ducks in a row. That's when I emailed uh, Michael, essentially, and, and communicated to him that this was my idea, and this is what I would like to do, and he seemed interested in it. He thought it sounded like a good idea, but he said, I, I have to, we have to run it by the band and see what they think, and so then a lot of time went by and I didn't hear anything and I occasionally I would you know kind of pry in have you guys heard anything and they're like oh well this is there's so much so many moving parts right now we're, we're you know we're not sure and so it wasn't actually until July so this is just barely a month and a half before the actual show that uh, I finally got word that it was probably going to happen, but I needed to make sure I was in San Francisco the last week of August, which is the week before the first rehearsal, um, because the band wanted to hear it. And so I had to go to the, the HQ and play it for the band. And so without any guarantee that this was even going to happen, I had to invest thousands of dollars and lots of time in, in, uh, to writing this thing and, and learning it and training myself and, well, and hiring people to teach me how to use these effects and tune them and get the right sound and have a pedal board built and, and all of that. But there was no way I was going to do a halfway job on this. It was uh, too important to me. 
This episode is brought to you by Ear Trumpet Labs. These are hand-built microphones out of Portland, Oregon, and they make an excellent mic for upright bass called Nadine. Barry Green got to try out this mic at our 2020 Online Bass Summit where Ear Trumpet Labs was a sponsor, and he was singing its praises all weekend long. It's an instrument-mounted condenser mic with an incredibly clear, natural sound and great feedback rejection. It's durable and works with in-ears, monitors, you name it. Not to mention, Christian McBride, Barry Bales, and Missy Raines are all Nadine users. Whether it's classical, jazz, Americana, or bluegrass, this mic seriously delivers, and they're offering a free t-shirt, especially to Contrabass Conversations listeners with a purchase of a mic. Just visit www.eartrumpetlabs.com slash Contrabass to claim yours and check out Nadine. I am so proud to have my course with Discover Double Bass Beginner's Classical Bass out in the world. This was a long time coming, friends, and this course is designed, as the name implies, for beginner bassists who want to learn how to play classical music or for more experienced players who wish to revisit the foundations of technique. The course is comprised of 66 lessons over four hours and covers a wide range of topics on classical bass, which will make a real difference to you playing. It is the perfect course for beginners. I feel weird saying that since my course, but I, I definitely believe in it, to build a solid foundation of double bass technique and to help you feel confident playing. Many of the lessons include transcriptions of the pieces, exercises, and etudes, so you have everything you need to practice at home. I spent hundreds of hours putting this together over the last few years. I'm so glad to see it out in the world. We have a link to it in the show notes, or just visit discoverdoublebase.com slash Jason Heath. So even before knowing, you had, you yeah. had no guarantee, and you you hadn't played electric upright before. Never. Or used pedals before. Never. And so, uh, and, and so March, this was announced, right? So you yeah. started kind of getting this going and getting yep. it. So, so prepping without any any word on whether yeah. this is going to happen. Yeah, yeah. So I, the electric upright arrived in, it was like, I think it was early July, late June, something like that. It arrived and I started toying around on it. And, and, um, and then I, it was around that time that I finally got my, the, the sound with the effects that I was looking for originally. So I had actually contacted Morley cause that's the pedal that Cliff used. He used this Morley, uh, fuzz wah and, uh, and he had altered it and, you know, gotten inside of it. And I learned a lot about this from big Mick, who's the sound engineer uh, for Metallica and has been since those days. And he was there when Cliff was there and, and he was telling me what Cliff did, how he got in there and kind of toyed around with the interior of it. And, um, and I was going to use that pedal, but just because of the pedal, the way the pedal was was laid out it just um it wasn't going to be the right thing for the way i wanted to do the solo but i loved the sound of it so i'm very grateful for them for sending that to me but i ended up uh, not using it i used um a number of other pedals which i can get into if we need to yeah, but, uh, well, i'd love to know what you use because i know that you you hit the the fuzz the, the effects going when you're way up on the bass right so like no, just that legit. Was, so no i hit the fuzz when i hit this this fifth chord okay uh, at, 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 in a low part and then i turn on the wah oh. when i go up high okay okay yeah, yeah. yeah. When you turn it, okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So that is like a fiddly operation with that yeah. morally, right? If you're going to try to do it, well, just because a... of where the buttons are to turn mm. it on, they're like on this little corner on the sides. And the way I decided I or constructed the solo is there was a very specific spot where I had to turn on that fuzz and it had to happen in a split second at the right spot and if I missed that button for some reason it would just it would ruin the whole moment in front of 18,000 people in front of 18,000 people <laughs> and, Metallica. Yes. And, and Metallica and in the band or no, the, the orchestra and then cameras everywhere yeah. and you know all that and so yeah so I wanted to make sure I had a clear shot to that button and then uh, and then the way I wanted to, the fuzz to turn on I did this lick and then I get up to the top of the like of the instrument and I wanted it to be kind of like it's wailing and kind of crying and and uh and that's where i wanted to be able to as they say toe up on the on the uh, wah pedal and get it to click on and then i would be up in a the sort of the higher frequency range of the wah pedal and then and then sort of pull it down from there and it was um it, it yeah it just had there's very specific ways this that i wrote this and that it needed to work and so yeah well and you got together with somebody basically took lessons right yeah, on yeah, how to yeah. use this and but so, so so talk through just what the pedal board itself and like what you ended up using on yeah the... so um i well i bought a number of different fuzz pedals and uh to try and find the right sound uh and like the morley definitely had the right sound but just as i mentioned the layout wasn't right for me 
And then I tried some other ones. And then I wanted up settling on or, or very happily using was it was made by some small company in Texas called Ryra, which I think stands for Rock Your Reconditioned Amp or something like this. Some very eccentric <laughs> yeah. genius that lives in some small town that makes these, hand makes these. And it, and it with the, the key is it's it's not a silicone fuzz, it's a germanium. And I can't believe I know all this stuff now. But um, And that was more popular back in the 70s and perhaps early 80s uh with it has this sort of just dirtier sort of sound to it and it's a just different kind of sound and so i was it was very appealing to me as soon as i plugged it in it was just it was the raw dirt that i was looking for and i just loved it also discover or just learned that cliff would sometimes use a harmonizer and so one of the other pedals i use and this i have on the instrument or is, is going it's uh or i should say it's on um from the beginning of the solo is it's uh, by boss and it's called the harmonist and so what that pedal does is it gives sort of a three-dimensionality to your sound and so it's actually following me or shadowing me about five cents flat of the pitch that i'm playing mm. so it's just so it just gives you this sort of chorus effect essentially which is a little weird to get used to just because like you know you hear these other sort of pitches in there <laughs> it's a little uh, unsettling but you get used to it I mean, it's a cool effect very very cool effect and then there's that fuzz pedal and then the wah pedal is um uh was made by exotic which is a company here in california and what i really liked about that pedal is it has a lot of adjustability to it there's a um you can change the amount of effect that's in it what the sweep of the pedal is and there's bass and treble controls and so so there was a lot of uh, a lot of things that you can do with that pedal to customize it um, and then i also had a um, a compressor and a preamp pedal as well this episode is brought to you by Dorico, the advanced music notation software from Steinberg. And one of the features that perplexed me at first, and then I realized its brilliance, is their concept of flows. Here is Daniel Spreadbury, senior product manager, on what flows are and how they work. The ability to have multiple exercises or multiple songs or whatever, you know, it's so obvious because music is very rarely just one through composed bit from right. start to end, you know, whether it's a show or a symphony or a sonata or a songbook or whatever. Music's in sections. That's just how it works. That is how it works, but that's not how most music notation software works. And the ability to break things up like that, oh my goodness, when I'm creating exercises or anything of the sort for my students or any sort of project that I have going, that makes organization so much easier exporting is a breeze everything that you do in dorico is beautiful from the get-go which is really cool coming from other pieces of software check them out at dorico.com that'll take you to their site on steinberg's website and they have a free product called dorico se where you can do practically everything that you can in the full version of dorico for up to two parts that's more than enough if you're doing bass duets or anything of the like thank you so much for sponsoring the podcast dorico my dear daily companion for practicing is the app Modacity. I love it so much. And the interface is so simple. You open it up and you see a microphone and a timer. And here is Modacity founder Mark Gelfel on why you see that in the interface. It comes down to practice efficiency. And practice efficiency, the way that I think about it, is an equation with three different variables. One of them is learning milestones. One of them is retention. And the other is time. I define practice efficiency as learning milestones times retention divided by time spent. Modacity has helped my practicing so much and so many other people I know. You can learn more at modacity.co and visit our site for a special offer on lifetime access to this app. Thank you so much for sponsoring the podcast, Modacity. So you, so you got this thing, you're, you decided you're just going to assume it's on, even though you haven't heard yeah. whether the gig's happening, whether yeah. you're on, well, the gig's happening, but whether you're going to be doing yeah, this. part of the and, show. And then you hear back. Well, I hear in, in, early, in early July that I need to make sure I'm around in late August to play it for the band. And I had a trip actually planned to uh, go to the East Coast uh, that week, and I canceled it because I was like, I'm not going to miss this. And so, um, so then I that week happens and then I, I get the texts like a couple days before right they want you at HQ by 3.30 on Thursday and and, um, and the band wants to hear it and uh, so I'm I'm ready man I'm, I've done my homework and I'm ready to go and I'm ex really I was really excited I was nervous but uh, but oddly enough once I got to the HQ and did it for them actually I, I, I actually wasn't that nervous I was really just kind of happy and excited to be there but 
yeah, the lead up to it, I was a little more nervous than the actual moment. Uh, but it was pretty cool. So I, I uh, get to the Metallica headquarters in San Rafael and and I walk in. Some people are introduced to me and then they said the band is in the uh, in the booth uh, doing some rehearsing and going over the set list and stuff. And so I walk in and the first person to see me is Lars. And he we I know Lars because he lives here and he comes to concerts every now and then. We've talked a number of times. And, and so he says hello and we're chatting and then I get introduced to – or no, before I'm even introduced to Kirk Hammond, He's sitting there noodling on his guitar, and he looks up to me. And he's like, "So, who are you? What do you do?" <laughs> it's really funny. And I said, "Well, uh, my name's Scott, and allegedly I'm a bass player." <laughs> and he's like, "All right, cool." And then, and then Rob Trujillo, who's just a total gentleman and sweetheart, comes right over, and he's like, "Hey, man, great to meet you." And we're looking forward to hearing it. And um, so it was very nice. And then they continued on their meeting, and they said, "Let us finish this up, and then we'll uh, get to your." your thing and we want to hear it and so a little bit of time goes by and I go get set up in their rehearsal space and they set me up right where James Hetfield normally stands and James was not there for this he was still out of town he flew in um, I think the next morning so anyway they set me up there and once we get all the sound levels and everything's working then they all come in and stand like all these like producers and and uh people who work for the for basically metallica incorporated i mean i sort of realize what a huge operation this is there's like i don't know like 20 people engineers and all and then the band and all of standing in like a semicircle around me and then lars is like all right man uh no pressure but let's hear it or something like that and so i uh so i then i just started it and then after i finished they all cheered and they were hugging me and it was just super cool and it was really meaningful uh one of the first people to say something was kirk and he was like man cliff would have loved that and so that was just just really special for me to hear that especially from kirk because he and cliff were such close friends and um and then he and stefan chirazzi who's uh, one of the publicists from metallica who also knew cliff very well uh, then um we were hanging out in their sort of uh kitchen area and and uh talking for quite a while about cliff and they were telling about his influences and some, some things that i didn't actually know which was uh, but i suspected uh they told me that cliff was really into bach and knew a lot about classical music actually he was very into classical music but he, he knew a lot about Bach and I said I knew it I said when I was coming up with ideas for my sort of intro tribute to Cliff I just kept hearing different things of Bach in fact I was even almost kind of toying with writing a quasi Sarah Bond uh, as a kind of an intro and I said it's just it's so interesting to to and fascinating to hear that that's actually was a big part of uh, his uh, influence and he was a major influence with the genesis of that band and their musical language and their forms and their uh, harmonic language and their melodic content and and i got to learn more about that also after i met ray burton cliff's father uh after the night of the uh, first solo uh or the first performance i should say i was at a private party afterward and and i i ended up spending almost the entire time with ray who is like he was 94 years old and totally outlasted me at the party like i was just dying <laughs> and i'm like i gotta go man it was getting really late and uh and so uh so i left and uh um and then uh, but we we had i had been in touch with cliff's um stepsister casey meeks ramirez uh and she um she also helped uh, coordinate meeting with Ray and and, uh, and whatnot. And um, anyway, uh, then uh, then the, we had another the other show on that the following Sunday, and and I also got to spend more time with Ray after that, which was very special. And um, it was a really wonderful experience. And he was he told me he was very very moved by it, and that uh, he says the first night he was just so kind of excited by everything, and then the second night he says he was moved to tears, and that was also one of the highlights of the whole thing for me was to have Cliff Burton's father uh, sort of give that blessing on it it was really wonderful and um anyway that that was yeah it was a wonderful experience uh all in all and of course i've heard from people from all over the world over that now and and uh and especially now that it's been shown in theaters it was shown in uh, almost 3,700 cinemas worldwide in almost 100 different countries and so i don't even know how many hundreds of thousands or even millions of people have seen it at this point a lot more people have seen solo bass than they did a couple months ago and so it's been really neat just uh just people from really like all the ends of the earth uh, uh contacting me and it's just been it's been very powerful experience 
Now you're no stranger, stranger. You know, <laughs> you're no stranger to playing concerts. Yeah, probably that's the biggest audience you played for. Chase Center. Oh, certainly. Yeah. yeah before that, uh, at least as a solo or play, playing a solo, the biggest I'd ever played for was playing Mahler One in the Proms at Lon- in London, which is I think like five thousand or six thousand people. And uh, and then I had there was it was also broadcast across the BBC, so there's like a little microphone right in front of me, and I was. I, I would say I was more nervous for that than than playing in front of the eighteen thousand people in the Chase Center and with the cameras on me. I don't know why. Uh, maybe maybe it's just just sort of. Well, no, it's all it's, it was all exposed. So I don't know. I don't know why. And there's something about that cursed solo. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's yeah. something about. But that yeah, I mean, it's, yeah. it's incredible the foot the and I I I look forward to seeing what they showed in the movie theater because even just some fan videos you know you can see there are close-ups of your bow arm yeah, as you're playing i yeah. mean it's like an incredible um did that eighteen thousand feel bigger than the five thousand the the proms uh, you know what's interesting is like it's it, yeah, i think it, the audience gets to a scale at some point it's almost not comprehensible yeah you know and uh so when we walked out with that full house, I mean, both nights were sold out almost instantaneously. And so it was just packed and just people cheering and the energy in the room. And it's just so infectious and it's so just awesome. It's a highlight of my career in, in, in some ways. And uh, so it was really exciting. And I, and I didn't feel a sense of uh, kind of fear, I guess, uh, and um, so when we uh, or when I got up there to, to do the solo, I guess I was also just so focused that I was aware of the audience, but I wasn't really preoccupied with it at all. And even as I'm playing and I'm hearing people hooping and cheering, especially at the moment when they kind of when they realize what I'm doing, especially on that first night. I mean, the second night, they already it was it was already online or video, you know, bootleg videos and stuff. And so I think some people knew what to expect. But the first night, they didn't know what I was going to do. They knew it was a tribute to Cliff Burton. But what when I started playing one of those identifiable Cliff licks, uh, that's when they really start cheering. And and, um, uh, and I heard I could hear that through I was wearing in-ear headphones uh, that I had made for the for the for this. And, and uh, even through that, I could hear them quite loud <laughs> and uh it was an amazing experience and you've got a extensive jazz background so like improv is is familiar to you had you ever done anything remotely like this like have you written anything for solo bass before because you you weren't improvising up there you had created this composition yeah, yeah, right essentially yeah, essentially yeah i mean yeah. there was well there was a huge chunk of it there was a transcription right, of, right. of cliff's of course uh, the um uh studio version of his of that solo and then i took some motives from his and also some aspects of form from some of the other live versions that he did because i felt like i had permission to do that because he himself did it so many different ways and i wanted it to mainly be about him and uh, but i wanted to sort of add my own sort of gratitude in the solo and and express in different ways not just his musicianship but his value as a person and so the the opening is sort of conceived this this sort of deep low uh uh ethereal thing through which uh this sort of mourning evolves from and uh and so i'm playing with these intervals which he sort of plays with in his solo with these fifths and some seconds and 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 uh and sort of reaching up to something and then when i get up to this this high d in the solo it, it, there's that's a moment where i actually quote the final lick that he usually plays when he would do it after he would do that really fast section he would play this lick that was sort of a cue for lars to know that he was done and this was the end of the solo and so i i thought of that was like one of his final statements when he would play his solo i thought that this was sort of a way to sort of work backwards in a way and it's almost like him calling out to his friends and, 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 and there was sort of a lamentation into it and then I would play with some of his licks sort of like him kind of saying to his buddies and to his fans like hey I miss you guys remember when I used to play this lick and I used to do this and and I, I love you guys and we were friends and you know like all of that kind of thing like his humanity and I really wanted to try and uh, speak to that and then I go through some chords and stuff that which after I quote a little bit of his solo i do these these chords which get work my way down the instrument which were intended to be a kind of sort of expression of sort of frustration like he's still trying to break through and then i get to this moment where right right when i hit that fuzz pedal to me that's where it's like 
I wish that they could have coordinated it with the light engineer to like have all the lights turn on or something in that moment. Because to me, that's like where he sort of bursts through. And then I you know play this fast lick and I get up to the top and then it's him just like wailing. And then I get back and then play like the heart and soul of this sort of transcription of his solo. And then and then Lars comes and joins me. And, and boy, what a treat to get to play with the original drummer on those recordings and, and the, one of the co-founders of the band. And uh, and we had a lot of fun working on it together. And 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 um, yeah, it, 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 and and to just and to end it and just have the audience just like cheering like that and and so appreciative and it all just felt good it was wonderful well and even though even though there have been it was like how many years ago was that original collaboration with metallic and san francisco symphony that was like, 20 years tw- ago okay 20 it was years 1999. ago 1999 so even though they've done that still a lot of people might not think oh metallica symphonic music that that doesn't go together. But I've always thought of Metallica as a very symphonic yes. sort of ensemble and Cliff's playing and yep. I mean, just those textures. Yep. Um, so it actually, I think there are a lot of commonalities between what they do and, and absolutely. They, I think they is, is, is vastly different as they seem prima facie to be. I think in reality, there's a lot of similarities as you dig into it and you go deeper and particular with the forms uh some of the harmonic content like you said the textures and some of the melodic content some of the meaning of the songs are are things that are expressed very powerfully in in uh even like shostakovich and and many other composers i mean it's to me i hear so much relationship with uh with classical music and and uh because you know we we put these labels on it because we need to you know, find a way to discuss these things and I guess identify them. But to me, it's uh, not to be simplistic or relativistic, but it's all music, you know. You can place judgments however you want, but if, you know, like I like what Duke Ellington said about music is music is what sounds good. And, and I would add that it's, you know, that music is a, um, you know, is essentially, well, you know, sound is a form of energy, but it becomes music when it is imbued with meaning by a creative being. And I think that, you know, this, there's a lot of creativity and a lot of meaning that is in their songs. And, and, uh, I was very moved by, in particular, James Hetfield's performance and considering what he was going through too personally in his life and then immediately going into rehab after the shows were done. And it adds a whole nother element of just a power when you watch the show again and you think about what he was going through and the way he sang those songs. It was uh, very, very powerful. Well, what a great way to open a major facility. The Chase Center is where the Golden State Warriors play and yep. to have San Francisco Symphony and Metallica opening it up and yep. then to have a solo bass and yeah. this moving <laughs> tribute to that, that, that everybody loved and now a wider audience can check it out it's really cool so what a great idea how cool that it came together so quickly and it's getting the recognition that uh, well deserved recognition well, for thank sure you. Yeah, thank you You rock. So great to go back in time and listen to this. And definitely, folks, check out Bass World. If you're not a member of the International Society of Bassists, join up. It would be great to have you there. I talk about them all the time on this show. I have a lesson starting in 32 minutes, and I have four intros and outros to do. So I'm going to be briefer than normal here. And I told myself I must get these done. By the way, I was ranting and raving about wanting to buy a new microphone and tell myself I didn't need one. And then I got drunk one night, I think, and ordered it off of Amazon. So I'm talking on the road pod mic I think it's called and I it sounds a little bit different than the Shure SM58 that I usually use uh, so I'm getting used to it this is the first time I have talked into it ever is this intro and now this outro Scott is an amazing human being and I've learned so much about him over the from him rather over the years so definitely he, he's only on Instagram in terms of social media but he is a, a wise and and thoughtful bass player and teacher and I learned so much every time I spend some time with him. In fact, one of my technique 
items in Modacity. My practice app of choice is called Scott Pingle Right Hand Fingers. And feel free to email me or ask me about that and I can explain in more detail. But I need to be brief because my lesson is starting soon. So I want to thank the team, Michael Cooper, Steve Hinchy, Mitch Mooring, Trevor Jones, and Krista Copper. Krista makes... Uh, she does not make bases. Jason, uh-oh. Settle down, Jason. Mitch Mooring makes beautiful bases in the Dallas-Fort Worth area, and you can learn more about him at MitchMooring.com. That music you hear and have been hearing for 13 years, that's me jamming out with my good friend Eric Hochberg, erichochberg.com, if you want to learn about everything he does. I am your host, Jason Heath, and we will see you again soon for more life on the low end of the spectrum.